All right, so last week uh, we reviewed the activity of Jesus beginning from the second Passover in His ministry to the third Passover. Remember, we're, we're following the, you know, the big picture is we're following from one Passover to another. Those are the, that's the large way that this, this uh, series is divided. So this would be what we're going to talk about tonight, the second year of His public ministry. So we noted that uh, during this time he spent most of his time in the northern part of the country near his hometown and it was natural for him to stay there because that's where most of his disciples were. Remember we, we, you know, I've mentioned in the past that even though Jesus did uh, unusual things, obviously miracles and things like that, the way that he put his ministry together is very I don't want to say ordinary, but very methodical. He starts in the north, the people he gets are people from the north, people in his family, people he knows. He spends a lot of time in the north as he's beginning to train his disciples. Now, during this period, he becomes more bold in declaring his identity, and we saw his following increase greatly. More and more people begin to follow him to the point where he could no longer you know, move around freely. Uh, and it was during the second year that he officially appoints the 12 uh, apostles. So tonight we're going to uh, continue with the events that finish out this second year of ministry in the area of Galilee. And we start uh, with, uh, come on, don't, don't fail me now. There we go. We start with um, uh, event number 47. That's where we ought to be. Event number 47, the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 1 to 8. Uh, chapter 5, verse 1, to chapter 8, verse 1, Luke 6, 20 to 49. Sermon on the Mount is in the north. Not in Jerusalem, it's in the north. Um, the Sermon on the Mount is probably the most compact teaching covering the Christian experience found in the New Testament. Uh, I'm not always going to refer to this, but one of the things, one of the aspects of the trip to Israel that I remember the most that when I went was actually going to the place where this sermon uh, was preached, where the where a usual place where Jesus taught, and to hear the guide explain why they know this is the place. So a very interesting thing. Anyways, it's in the north. It's uh, recorded also by Luke in a different variation, which suggests that this was, this was the heart of Jesus' preaching, and he may have repeated this on a number of occasions. You know, like preachers have a good sermon, it's okay to preach a sermon another time. You go to another place, you, you preach the same sermon. If it worked in Choctaw, it might work if you go out to California or go up to Montreal. The Bible is the Bible. So many scholars believe that this, is, this was the core of Jesus' teaching and He repeated it uh, many times. The Beatitudes, as some call them, describe the attitude and the spirit of one who had been freed from the law and was now motivated by grace enabled by the Holy Spirit and guided by the word of Christ. And one of the things, one of the reasons why they didn't get it when he said it is that they were not enabled by the Holy Spirit. They were not motivated by grace. They were not guided at that time by the word of Christ as the Son of God. He was, he was speaking it, but they weren't yet understanding what he was saying. I mean, how else could the meek be happy? How else could one see God? How else could one inherit the earth or rejoice in persecution if it wasn't through the power of the Holy Spirit, if it wasn't through the eyes of faith in Jesus Christ? I mean, it didn't make any sense you know, from a worldly perspective. So what Jesus describes in the Sermon on the Mount is the life of one who lives in the kingdom of God, which had not yet come but was about to be established with His, dead, uh, his death and resurrection. So the Sermon on the Mount is actually a preview of what life is like in the church. It's a preview of what is life like in the spirit. And Jesus was you know, preparing them with this, with this teaching. Number 48, event number 48, healing of the centurion's servant, Matthew 8, 5 to 13, and Luke 7, 1 to 10. So this miracle took place in Capernaum, again in the north, Jesus' hometown. Now what was interesting in this dialogue with this man was that Jesus has just preached a sermon about the kingdom and life in the kingdom to the Jews, 
who assumed that it was all for them because they were Jews. So in healing this non-Jew servant, Jesus reminds His hearers that entry into the kingdom is based on faith, not on culture. Now to, to us today, you know, that's not a big deal. You know, we, the church, we know it's open to everyone, you know, uh, black, white, Asian, wh whatever. It's open to everybody. But that was not the thinking of the Jews that Jesus was preaching to. And this is what the people you know, uh, were angry with him about. You know, the centurion believed Jesus and Jesus was amazed at his faith which he had not yet seen among the Jews. So the leaders were upset with Jesus because he threatened their authority. And the people were upset with Jesus because he offered the kingdom to both Jews and Gentiles based on faith. So the Jews, they thought they had an inside track. They thought only them. So now Jesus is healing, whoa, the servant of a Gentile? Are you kidding me? So no special treatment for the Jews, except they were the first ones to receive the invitation, as per the prophets. And they're the one person to reject it too. Exactly, absolutely. And the prophets said that you, he'll offer it to you and you'll reject it. So Jesus is simply following through on what the prophets had already said. Good point, thank you. Number 49, raising the widow's son. Only one uh, description of that, Luke 7, 11 to 17. This is, one of these, this is one of the three times that Jesus performs the miracle of raising someone from the dead. He did it three times. He did it for the widow's son, he did it for, who else, anybody? Take a guess. Lazarus, who's the other one? Yeah, Jairus' daughter. You know, I, I don't know about you, but I, I would tend to believe that he was the Messiah with just one resurrection from the dead. You know what I'm saying? But he gave them three. Yep, quickly, um, we got a lot. It says that uh, in the Bible that Jesus did many more miracles and it, they recorded all of them in his book. Absolutely. So is it for sure that it's only three people? No, I said recorded. Recorded, yeah. Only three. Only three. <laughs> he only resurrected three people from the dead. You know, for me, one would be enough, but you know. So aside from being a mighty sign in itself, it was also a proof that he was the Messiah, since the scripture said that the Messiah would be able to do this. So it was also a preview of his own resurrection. I mean, one who had the power to raise others from the grave, not once, but three times that we know of, could also be raised from the dead himself. Next event, number 50, Jesus rebukes the unbelieving cities, Matthew eleven twenty 20 to 30. Now even though there was interest and there were crowds, even though He performs many miracles and teaches for a long period of time, the main cities in that area, Capernaum, Bethsaida, Chorazin, all of them failed to accept Him or recognize Him as the Messiah. So Jesus does two things in response to this rejection. First, He rebukes them and warns them of the eventual judgment and destruction that will come upon them. And secondly, He invites those who are burdened and weakened to come to Him. The point is that these cities felt themselves to be too wise and superior to believe in Him, so He rejects them and He invites the lowly to come. You know, his point is, okay, you guys are too good to believe, you're too good, you're too wise, you're too smart, to believe in me, to accept me, fine, I reject you. you you're, you're going off to judgment. But all of you who are lowly, all of you who are burdened, all of you who are you know, struggling, don't be afraid, come to me. Don't do like these guys. That's, that's, the, you know, that's the analogy, not the analogy, but the comparison that he's making here. 51, the woman anoints Jesus' feet, Luke 7, 36 to 50. Again, one time, Luke is really carrying the load here. So we know the story, Jesus is eating with Simon the Pharisee and while eating a woman comes and anoints his feet with her tears. She pours perfume on them, she kisses his feet, she dries his feet with her hair. Isn't it ironic that Simon personifies all the cities that Jesus rebuked earlier with his self-righteous attitude towards the woman. You know, he rejects her, 
because she's a sinner. And his unbelieving attitude towards Jesus. Jesus says, you, know, you didn't honor me when I came. You didn't offer water for my feet. You didn't, you know, you didn't put oil for my, for my head. You know, as a, a sign. I mean, they didn't pour oil. Just a drop of oil is a sign of respect. Uh, you didn't kiss me. You didn't give me a greeting of any kind. And he says, and this woman, she's kissing my feet. She's anointing my feet. So this woman represents well all of those weary and uh, individuals who are heavy laden people that Jesus called to Himself. So He says it in the first, you know, he, he, he talks about this in one event about the cities who reject Him, that's the macrocosm, and then you have the microcosm where He's just alone with one person, you know, the two people, the unbeliever and the believer, and He, you know, he compares the, the reaction of the two. So this is another time when Jesus has his feet washed, excuse me, there is another time when Jesus has his feet washed and so on and so forth, but it'll be by Mary, who is the sister of Martha, and it'll be further towards the end of his ministry. Number 52, and remember, by the way, this is chronological study, right? It's not discuss and debate. We could, we could spend a lot of time on each one, but we have 180 plus events to, to cover, so we're trying to get them in, in a row. More circuit preaching in Galilee. Luke 8, 1 to 3, so Jesus continues His preaching ministry with the apostles. He's in the north. All of these events are taking place one after the other. This time, Luke mentions how His ministry was financed. He says that many of the wealthy women from the king's court helped support Jesus and the apostles in their, in their ministry. It's so amazing, just that little detail, so important to understand, because you know, we have questions, well, how did he live? How did he eat? Did he beg food? Did he you know, go from door to door? Did he miraculously make food for himself and the apostles? No. You know, the Bible takes two lines to, and it explains everything. They had the resources that they needed for their ministry. The wealthy ones provided for, for him. 53, Jesus heals a demoniac. This time we have more coverage, Matthew 12, 22 to 37, Mark 3, 22 to 30, and Luke 11, 14 to 15. Now the significant thing about the healing of this demon-possessed man was that it, was, it marked a new line of attack taken against him by the Pharisees. Obviously the Pharisees, some all the way from Jerusalem, were beginning to target him more ferociously than before. In the past, they tried to discredit his teaching or his authority, but now there's an attack against his character saying that he himself is of the devil. So of course, the fact that he casts out the devil, that's an amazing miracle, but the point of the story is to demonstrate the heightened uh, viciousness of the attack of the Pharisees. You know, this is the story where they say, oh well, he's casting out demons by the power of Satan. In other words, Jesus himself was possessed by Satan. And of course Jesus answers that if this is so then Satan is destroying himself because he has just cast out the devil you know, out of a man, not put him into the, into the man. And so you, I, I, I want you to kind of see and feel you know, tensions are mounting. You know, remember I, I, I mentioned at first they thought he was just annoying. Who is this guy? Who is this clown you know, coming in here, knocking over the tables, you know, making a big to-do at the temple? Who is this guy? Now it's getting serious. Now they're attacking his character. They're trying to destroy his character in front of the, in front of the people. 54, the crowd seeks a sign. Matthew 12, 38 to 45. Luke 11, uh, verse 16, and then a little further down, 24 to 36. So the Pharisees and scribes respond by saying that they want a miracle, a sign, in order to prove Jesus' identity and His divinity. He tells them that aside from the ones already done, the one true sign that will settle the matter once and for all will be His death and resurrection. So when he says the sign of Jonah, this is a cryptic way of saying that. When he says the only sign I'll give you is the sign of Jonah, this is a cryptic way of referring to His death and resurrection. You know, the prophet said, David, uh, Peter quotes him in Acts chapter 2, the prophet said that the Messiah would have power over death. Even Paul in Romans chapter 1 verse 4 says that the resurrection is the definitive proof that Jesus was the Son of God, the Messiah. Yeah, He did miracles. Yes, He multiplied the fish. And the, uh, yes, He walked on the water and so on and so forth. But if you were to ask Him, 
what is the definitive sign that you are who you say you are? He, he answers the definitive sign, the death and resurrection, the sign of Jonah. Number 55, Jesus' family come for him. Nice slice of life right here, just so typical, so human. I'm sorry? Number 55 is not on the sheet. Okay, I apologize. We put it at the bottom there. Matthew 12, 46 to 50, Mark 3, 20 to 21, and 31 to 35, and Luke 8, 19 to 20, uh, 21. So all these accusations, all this confusion lead his family to come and try to bring him home thinking that he has lost it. I mean, that's what I'd do for my son if he were out in the public and he was doing something public, whatever, whatever it would be, and all of a sudden he was being attacked by the leaders of the country or the leaders of the church and, and the crowds were around him and there was confusion and, you know, and wherever he went he couldn't get away from anything. I mean, as a concerned parent, I'd, I'd want to say, hey, you know, let, come home, you, know, you need to rest. You need to relax, you need to get away from all this. You know? And uh, don't you think it's a little dangerous out there, you know, confronting the authorities? I've even heard the rumor that the, they're out to, to kill you. So as a parent, I mean, I, I'd reach out to my child to try to talk some sense into them. Probably say, hey, slow down, you know, slow down a little bit. Do you have to be so confrontational? Do you have to call, do you, must you call the Pharisees hypocrites in public? I mean, do you really have to do that? So their concern may have been sincere and normal, but it also showed disbelief. And Jesus points this out when He claims that those who believe are His true brothers and sisters. And it's the same with us, right? Our true family is our Christian family. I'm not denigrating our physical family, obviously. But if we prefer non-believers to believers, then in a sense we love the world more than we love the, the kingdom. And I, and I understand what it's like to have people in your family who don't believe, who just don't believe. They don't accept Christ. They, they will not do it. You love them, of course you love them. And they're family, they'll always be family and so on and so forth. But there's like this wall, this invisible shield that's between you and them. They, they won't cross over to you and you, you know, you, you, they ask you questions about your faith and you ever know, you ever had that feeling and you answer and it's like you're going wow, 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 wow. It's like it makes no sense because it's an unbelieving hard heart and it just bounces off of them. Well, this was, this was the experience here with Jesus. Number 56, seven parables from a boat. Matthew 13, 1 to 53, Mark 4, 1 to 34, Luke 8, 4 to 18. So again, he is in Galilee. He's in the region at Capernaum, his home. He enters a boat to teach the crowd on the shore and the writers record a series of seven parables that are strung together as a lesson. And these are the seven parables that are strung together to form a lesson. The, the sower and the seed, the wheat and the tares, the mustard seed, the leaven, the treasures in a field, the pearl of great price and the parable of the Dragnet. The thing that I found interesting is that many times he'd string parable after parable, he'd string them all together as one, as one lesson. Uh, now there are a series of things, I'm just going to give you the events and then I'll do a little explaining after. The first one is event 57, Jesus calms the storm. Uh, Matthew 8, 18 to 27, Mark 4, 35 to 41, and Luke 8, 22 to 25. So Jesus calms the storm. Um, everybody got that? All right, number 58, Jesus cures two demoniacs. Matthew 8, 28 to 34, Mark 5, 1 to 20, and Luke 8, 26 to 40. And then the other one, number 59, Jesus raises, and there's Jairus' daughter, and cures a woman with a hemorrhage, uh, all three Gospel writers refer to these, Matthew 9, 1, and then 
18 to 26, Mark 5, 21 to 43, and Luke 8, 40 to 56. And then there's one more event. Again, all these events just happen, bang, 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 one after another. All right, I'm about to change it, good. 5, 21 to 43, Luke 8, 40 to 56. And then number 60, Jesus heals the blind and another demoniac, this time just Matthew 9, 27, 34. Okay, so after the long teaching section, the writers describe a series of amazing miracles as Jesus leaves one shore of the lake and He crosses over to the other shore of the lake. This lake is like, you know, uh, highway 35 and highway 40, you, you know what I'm saying? They, they crisscross this lake all the time. And so they cross over and on His first pass, um, um, He miraculously calms the fierce storm. So He does a miracle while He's in the boat. On His arrival, He cures a demoniac and He sends him off to his native country where Jesus will later go and have greater success in preaching and we'll find that out in a future lesson. Uh, we'll come back to the demoniac and what he did. And then he crosses back over the lake and this time he raises a young girl from the dead and he heals a woman who suffered from an, incur an incurable hemorrhage. So you know, cross the lake, do a miracle while you're in the boat, heal the demoniac, cross the lake, Go back to the other side, heal, you know, raise the Jairus' daughter, uh, heal the lady, and finally he cures a blind man and one who was unable to speak. So the net result was that he had performed miracles the like of which had never been done anywhere before. And he demonstrated that he had power, see the point here is that he had power over the creation, he had power over death, he had power over every kind of disease. Exactly the kind of power that no ordinary faith healer could and did have. But only the kind of power that God Himself could have. We have had faith healers, you know that you got a sore back, heal, you know, oh my man, that dislocated disc feels a lot better all of a sudden, you know, or you, I've suffered from migraines, you know, and heal, you know, and the migraines are gone. Nobody has calmed the sea lately. You know, no one has risen from that. Remember Oral Roberts? Remember he used to say, he used to claim that he had you know, raised people from the dead. Remember, and that, that was like back in the 90s. And remember I used to say about Oral Roberts? I, I, I openly challenged Oral Roberts and I told him in a public place, and we'll, we'll get the bodies from you know, uh, the funeral parlor, um, our friend, uh, Eisenhower, Eisenhower will provide us the bodies. And the challenge is, for every single one that Oral raises from the dead, I will raise two. <laughs> the only caveat was he had to go first. <laughs> right? So Jesus, however, is doing this not once, twice, but three times the power over creation, the power over death, power over every disease, uh, always again demonstrating His role as the Messiah. Number 61, Jesus rejected in Nazareth. So now we get the blowback, the fallout. Despite all these signs and wonders, despite all the teaching, His native city still refuses to believe in Him. And again, one of the, one of the advantages of doing it in chronological order, the way we're doing it is, he had done all of these things in the north, in succession. There was no way that these cities could not have heard of what he had done in a very small amount of time. I mean, we're talking about his second year of ministry, and they still, they still reject him. They don't try to stone him, but they simply refuse to accept him, and for this reason, he does no miracles. Why? You know, why? 62, the fi uh, final, final preaching tour through Galilee. Final preaching tour through Galilee. Matthew chapter 9, verse 35 to 38, and Mark chapter 6, verse 6. So one final tour through his native region before going further north, 
and then down to Jerusalem for the feast. So he continues to preach, he continues to teach and heal where they will receive him, but not in his hometown. 63, Jesus sends out the 12. A change, a shift now in attitude. Matthew 10, 1 to Matthew 11, 1, Mark 6, 7 to 13, and Luke 9 to 16. So after several tours with him, Jesus now sends the 12 out by themselves to begin their public ministry in their own towns, in their own village. See the method? You know, it wasn't willy-nilly, it was very methodical. He selects them, he trains them, performs many miracles, they hear the teaching, they travel with him for a year, he does the circuit, and now it's their turn to go. Now the writers provide the instructions for the ministry that Jesus provided them with and also describe the power He gave them to do their work. So they go off with the power to do miracles in His name, power given to confirm their message about the kingdom, because after all, who are they? Well, they're just fishermen. Fishermen, uh, you know, political zealot, a tax collector. You know, who are these people? They're nobodies. So Jesus empowers them to demonstrate that their words are followed by, by power. And remember, they're speaking only in Jesus' name. 64, now, the, now you know, the game is up now. Herod takes note of Jesus. Matthew 14, 1 to 12, Mark 6, 14 to 29, Luke 9, 7 to 9. Now Herod thought that he took care of his problem by executing John the Baptist. Now that the rise of Jesus' ministry is reaching his ears, he begins to wonder, who is this Jesus? And Jesus is preaching about the kingdom. Jesus' disciples are baptizing. People are flocking to Him. It's like deja vu. You know, wow, wait a minute, this bad dream is coming back. So his conclusion is that Jesus is John resurrected and come to denounce Him again. Now this was dangerous for Jesus and we see that he withdraws to a more secluded place for safety. Is he afraid? Well, no, he's not afraid, but he has a timetable. There are things that he has to do and he needs to avoid uh, being captured or imprisoned you know, before his time. 65, the 12 return. And it's interesting that all four Carolyn, I hope I've got it right this time. All four gospel writers <laughs> talk about it. Matthew 14, 13 to 21, Mark 6, 30 to 44, Luke 9, 10 to 17, John 6, 1 to 14. All the writers describe the excitement when the apostles return from their first preaching tour. And he takes them to a quiet place for them to rest after their work, probably to teach them some more and respond to the various questions and problems. I've noted that young ministers, you know, when they, it's like anything else. It's like guys in the military. You know, they go to boot camp and they go to training, blah, 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 and they think they know everything and then they actually get out in the field and they realize you, know, you don't know nothing. You don't know squat. You know. Now your education really begins. And I think it's like that in most uh, uh, in most uh, trades or you know you go to school you learn stuff you know I remember when I worked in sales guys would come with a BA in marketing and they'd show up uh, you know at the company where I was working and it was always a fiasco you know the sales manager had to kind of calm them down and say okay now we're going to start your now your education starts so it's a little bit like this you know they go out they do things they're excited and Jesus is kind of bringing them back to earth now he's going to explain to them other things so their success uh, cuts it short as the crowds find them for more ministry. So Jesus responds by teaching them and when the hour is late, He performs a great miracle, the feeding of the 5,000 from just a few loaves of bread and fish. Now, Jesus will perform this miracle a second time later on, this time for a crowd of 4,000 people at another site. This particular miracle, very interesting, it's a sign of several things. One, Jesus' power over the physical universe and the laws of the universe. Also, a preview of the great spiritual banquet that He's preparing in the kingdom 
and an encouragement to rely on Jesus to provide not only spiritual but our physical needs as well. Uh, 66, Jesus sends the 12, here we go, across the lake. Again, Matthew 14, 22 to 23, Mark 6, 45 to 56, and John chapter 6, 15 to 21. So after the kind of debriefing and the miracle, Jesus will send them once again across the lake in order to continue their work. And it's at this occasion that Jesus came to them while walking on the water and Peter requested that he too come to him. So you know, on one of these trips he does a miracle while he's in the boat. On another one of these trips he walks on the water to the boat and Peter himself gets out of the boat and for a time walks on the water. Now, Note that they, himself, they themselves had performed miracles and so Peter was primed to push the edge of this newly given power by asking to do yet another miraculous, you know, he had performed miracles, he had healed, he had cast out demons, you know, Peter did it himself, so where do you think he got the courage to say, well, can I, can I do this too? And Jesus said, come on boy, you can do it. You know, and he did it for a while, right? He did it for a little while and then his faith started. He, he realized, wait a minute, I'm walking on water, blah, 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 you know. <laughs> and that's what happens to us. We get into this zone when we're actually walking by faith. You know, we get into this zone where we're actually walking by faith, like we really, we can taste it. I am walking by faith each day. I really am depending on the Lord to provide each day. I'm not afraid, I'm not nervous, I'm not stressed, I'm not thinking about this and that. I'm kind of like everything is balanced. And then all of a sudden, it's, we look around and we go, wait a minute, this is not supposed to be happening. And then boom, boom you know, like Peter, you know, we sink. I just want us to remember that it's possible, it's possible. Peter, you know, he'll never forget that for a short time, he walked by faith. And I hope that we do that too, that for a short time we remember that it's possible to walk by faith and, and, and go across tremendous things because of our faith. Number 67, we're almost done, got to move. The crowd seeks a sign, oh yes. John 6, 22 to 71, so John uh, carries the story on here. The people have witnessed many miracles and now they find Jesus with the apostles on the other side of the lake, <laughs> back and forth. Uh, I, I can't help it, forgive me, I'll hold myself back next week, but you know, I've been on that boat and I've been on that lake when you cross back and forth from the cities and you can see the cities, you can see the places while you're on the lake. It's, it's a wonderful experience. So the people have witnessed a lot of miracles. They find Jesus with the apostles on the other side of the lake and they want another sign. They've been fed miraculously the day before, they want more, let's face it. They're ready to follow a Messiah who provides not only their spiritual needs, but can also provide the physical needs. Who wouldn't want a leader that miraculously provides you with your groceries? I'd vote for that guy, wouldn't you? So this is the passage where Jesus uses the imagery of bread to describe Himself as the bread from heaven. And He also alludes to the communion which He will institute in the future. You know, drink my blood, eat my flesh. Their first time, he makes the astounding promise that if someone believes in him, he will resurrect that person from the dead. This is the first time that he makes, this is two years now. Two years. And this is the first time he's going to make that, make that promise. Because it wasn't, all, it wasn't only preparing the apostles you know, to carry on the ministry, it was also getting the people ready to hear what he was going to say. So the, this dialogue accused, um, occurred excuse me, in the synagogue at Capernaum and because of his teachings about him being the bread and the manna from heaven, so on and so forth, eating his flesh, a lot of his disciples kind of left him. And that synagogue in Capernaum is still there. The, the foundation of it, the archeologists have discovered the, the foundation and the walls, the, the base walls of that and the entranceways and the original floor from 2,000 years ago, they have, there's, it's a protected historical site in, and Capernaum, that place still, still exists. So it was a critical moment for the apostles because they had seen and they had heard so much and now Jesus was speaking of things which they really couldn't understand. 
So he challenges their faith and Peter responded for all the apostles that they had no place to go but to him despite their lack of understanding, they believed. Let's face it, they were in, right? They were in so far there was no way back for them. And even though they didn't understand the next step that he was asking them to do, Peter is saying, look, we don't get it. I mean, we really don't get it. Eat your flesh, drink your blood, we don't get it. But we're not leaving. And sometimes that's our experience. We don't get it. We don't get what it is that God is asking us or, or pushing us towards or leading us to. We don't get it. Sometimes what's required is just to keep on going. Okay. So that is often the case in our lives as well. Things happen. We're faced with issues we don't understand. Our test is, do we continue to believe and obey even though we might not understand why? And that basically is the call to walk by faith. Despite the miracles they saw, the teachings they received, even the apostles had to do a stretch by faith every once in a while because He was right there next to them, teaching them, encouraging them, physically with them. But they too had to you know, take a couple of steps of faith even if Jesus was with them.